So we have a lot of voters that are these interesting swing voters that have emerged and, and you find them particularly in places like the Midwest. Take a state like Iowa, for instance, a state that actually voted for Barack Obama, but then flipped in this relatively solidly Trump country these days, or at least it's pretty safe for Republicans. Or a state like Indiana, where actually Barack Obama won Indiana, uh, at least in 2008, and yet Indiana is now not really considered a state um, that at least at a statewide level, Democrats have a strong shot at winning. Um, and a lot of the reason why is because you had these sort of white working class voters who began to view the Democratic Party as no longer really being in their interest. Um, that whichever party can kind of corner the market of saying, we understand the middle and working class will do quite well um, in many of these places. Uh, it's a good message for any party to have, but in particular, Donald Trump in 2016 was able to make the case to a number of voters who had voted for Obama in the past that he was going to be the one that would be best looking out for their economic interest, and he would be the one that would be most focused on sort of fighting the elites. Again, it's a little bit less about a left-right perspective and more about a sort of power to the people versus power to the elites kind of argument. And that's why Donald Trump was able to peel away a number of these white working class voters for whom someone like Mitt Romney just wasn't really their flavor of Republican, but Donald Trump represented something different. And that's why they decided to go ahead and vote for him. However, you also had a lot of folks that maybe were Republicans, swing voters uh, that, that gave Donald Trump a shot in part because they wanted to send a message to those elites. But by the time you got to 2020 and we had seen the sort of chaos that the last four years had had, had um, whether it was uh, the response to the pandemic, whether it was, uh, you know, sort of the general um, uh, constant craziness of the news cycle. Um, there were a lot of voters that maybe had said they wanted to give Donald Trump a chance. But by the time you got to 2020, just sort of felt exhausted by it. And in a way, Joe Biden's message of I'm going to be a competent adult that you won't have to think of that much was actually appealing to quite a number of voters. Um, in the 2020 election, it was pretty interesting. You have a lot of people that are Donald Trump only voters at this point. They're not very closely connected to the political process. They think both parties get things pretty wrong. But when Donald Trump's name on a bet is on a ballot, they're willing to turn out. And that was good for Republicans in 2016. It was not so good for them in 2018 when Donald Trump wasn't on the ballot and Democrats swept and took control of the House of Representatives. In 2020, you saw sky high voter turnout and it wasn't just sky high voter turnout for Joe Biden. A lot of people did turn out for Donald Trump and you did again see some of those swings toward Trump in places you might not have expected. But ultimately Biden was able to sort of shore up these voters in the suburbs around major metropolitan areas who were just looking for a little more stability, a little less chaos, a little less constantly having to think about what was going on in Washington. If you take a look at maps of somewhere like Atlanta, for instance, um, a really crucial uh, state in this last election, because 20 years ago, the idea of Georgia becoming a blue state would have been a little bit crazy. Uh, and yet here we are, Georgia voting very narrowly for Biden and then sending two Democrats to the U.S. Senate. Uh, pretty surprising outcome if you look at it over a long enough term. And a lot of that was built off of these suburbs. There's a map that the New York Times Upshot folks put together. They looked at each precinct around Atlanta and whether that those precincts had swung to the right or to the left relative to where they had voted in the 2016 election. And if you look at Atlanta, actually the center of Atlanta hasn't moved that much. That urban voters were already pretty democratic as a coalition, they didn't move that much. But it was those suburbs around Atlanta that created this kind of blue donut around the city core. Uh, and that was a sign of those dense, sort of middle to upper middle class suburbs saying that they wanted stability, they wanted calm, they were off, the Trump train, um, and, and they voted for Biden in the process. Now, the real challenge for Democrats is, can you hold on to those voters? Um, if you have an economy that's not doing so great, if we're still dealing with COVID uh, a year from now, you know that's the one issue where Joe Biden gets pretty strong marks. Um, if we're still dealing with COVID, then perhaps some of the issues that those suburban voters had left the GOP over, they won't find very satisfying answers on the Democratic side either, and they'll be back up for grabs. If Donald Trump runs for president again, I suspect he'll find a reasonably easy time winning in a Republican primary, because even though he lost the election, and typically if you lose an election, your party sort of puts you into the wilderness for a little bit, 
because so many Republicans believe that the election was not fairly fought, believe Donald Trump should be the rightful president, there hasn't been a lot of introspection. You won't see any kind of autopsy coming out of the Republican Party this time. They believe that the party is still in a strong position and on the right path. And for a majority of Republicans, if Donald Trump were to run again, they say they would be open to voting for him. So in a primary, it's hard to imagine another Republican successfully defeating Donald Trump if he truly runs and decides he wants to do this again. But the general election is a very different matter. Um, in the general election, you have a lot of voters who were very frustrated with Donald Trump. Um, they broke away from him. And even if they had voted for Donald Trump, felt very disillusioned and dismayed by all of the chaos that unfolded after the election, whether it was uh, the questioning of the election results culminating in the events of January 6th, um, that Donald Trump has perhaps not done himself very many favors with swing voters in the time since he lost the, Nova the election in 2020. But at the same time, there's a big question about what Democrats will do. Both Donald Trump and Joe Biden would be quite old uh, when you uh, get around to 2024. Um, and if Joe Biden doesn't run, would it be Kamala Harris? Um, her favorable, unfavorable rating in a lot of polling I've looked at doesn't look great. Um, so you may have another election where you have two big candidates that voters in the middle aren't really crazy about and are left with a choice between, well, I don't really like either of these people. What do I do now? Um, so Donald Trump would be very formidable in a Republican primary in 2024, but I have serious doubts about his ability to win the White House again, given sort of the continued unpopularity he's experiencing, even among some of those voters who did vote for him in 2020. One of the big ironies of the political moment that we're in is at the same time that a lot of voters say that they don't really love either party, that they don't feel closely affiliated to either one, that we also have some of the greatest polarization that we've ever seen with Americans increasingly likely to segment themselves into camps. They may not like their own party very much, but they really don't like the other side. And that growing polarization isn't just about fights over what kind of policies are happening in Washington. It's bleeding into the kinds of products people want to buy, how they feel about major brands. Um, it's, it's showing up in people's fights over what kids should be taught in schools, et cetera. This polarization has gotten really deep, and I think it has been inflamed by the COVID-19 crisis. So if you have a lot of voters that are very disaffected from, uh, at least from the other party, as well as the one that they ostensibly uh, affiliate with, well, wouldn't there be room for another option? If everybody's so upset, why don't you create something new? And the reality is that structurally in the US, there are many reasons why a third party hasn't really emerged. Um, it is possible for a new party to emerge, but usually that would be displacing one of the two existing parties. Because of our single member district, first past the post system, a number of things sort of enshrined into the way we govern based on the constitution, just make it very hard for a third party to emerge. It's just the structure of our government is so different from many of these countries that have parliaments where you can have any number of parties participating in government. But I also always caution folks who are political elites and who imagine that if only we had a sort of centrist third party that would solve the problem. Typically, those folks have views that are a little more socially progressive, while at the same time being relatively fiscally conservative. You can think, for instance, of someone like Mike Bloomberg, former mayor of New York City, who tried to run, take this sort of in, more independent kind of tack. Um, you've seen a number of business leaders, uh, whether it's Howard Schultz, uh, or CEO of Starbucks, kind of taking that approach as well. You find that it doesn't actually have that much of an audience. And that's because the political center in America of those who are disaffected from the parties are much less likely to be that sort of socially progressive, fiscally conservative type of voter, and are more likely to be the opposite. They're more likely to be culturally conservative, but be okay with a more robust social safety net of wanting the government to be more actively involved in the economy. Um, these are, frankly, the very types of voters that Donald Trump added to the Republican coalition that had been pretty poorly served by both political parties for quite some time. So I think the question is, is it possible for, say, the Republican or the Democratic Party to co-opt that group of voters who feel underserved, bring them into their tent without alienating anyone else who's already there, that seems to be more likely than the prospect of creating some sort of centrist third party.
Now, I did that survey where I asked Americans, you know, looking at the five different political parties that we might have if we were a country like, say, Germany, uh, any number of these European democracies where they have sort of a far right party, a more traditional center right party, a center left party, a kind of classical liberal or libertarian party, and then finally a green party or a socialist party. Um, we find that in the US, most people would sort of prefer kind of a labor party, that one gets the plurality. They're not ready to go all the way to a green party type model. In fact, it's really only young Democrats who lean more towards saying that that's actually the vision that they would want. Um, and it is younger voters who are among the most interested in that sort of centrist libertarian type party. But even there, it's not necessarily the plurality response that you might expect. So I think when you ask people to choose among the five different parties, it's just a reminder that for some people, the current parties don't, they don't feel like they serve them well, but it's not because their views are in some sort of happy middle ground, but rather those parties are not viewed as being sort of committed or extreme enough. Uh, they're, they're not bold enough, perhaps, is the nicer way to frame it. And so some of those voters do wind up further on the outsides.